I've never seen a diamond in the flame I cut my teeth on wedding rings in the movies And I'm not proud of my days In a torn up town, no postcode Thank you. That was fun. The running in the circle, that was new. I was like, oh, it's a circle. Can't leave it. Um, <laughs> anyways, um, hi. My name is Gabby, and I am a violinist. Uh, but most importantly, actually, is I'm a survivor. Most people will look at me, and they see someone who's really healthy and happy and vibrant. But the truth is that for the past 10 years, till this year, I've been struggling with an eating disorder, which has kept me a prisoner. The truth is, I now have osteoporosis because of it. My organs have been weakened. I have to get blood work quite often, and I'm on a lot of medications. That's the ugly truth that I haven't talked about for a long time, because I've been very ashamed about it. But today, I'm gonna to tell you everything. I have very happy memories of my childhood. I actually remember uh, going on camping trips, family vacations with my parents, playing in the backyard with my sister, practicing with, she plays the violin too. Um, and I have, I have good memories for the most part. But there's also memories I have that are not so cheerful. They begin at the age of around three or four. Violent fights between my parents. Plates, punches were thrown. Tears and screams rang throughout the house. My mom would always take the keys and leave. I never thought she was coming back. A few times she took my sister and I and said that she was getting a divorce from my dad and that we weren't coming back. You know, this never happened, but I was always on edge, a big ball of anxiety just waiting for the next fight to break out. 
My sister still has a scar down her back from the time my dad, in a fit of rage, knocked in a window because he couldn't get in the front door. When I was 10, I was sexually abused by my tennis instructor, but I didn't tell anybody because I was embarrassed. And when I was 12, I got the wind knocked out of me, something that no person, let alone child, should ever have to experience. And when I was 15, when the eating disorder got really bad, I took a glass one day and I smashed it into my dad's head and he punched me in the face. He went to the hospital to get stitches and I walked around with a black eye. And when people asked me what happened, I just kept saying, I'm clumsy, I knocked into a kitchen cupboard. And so I kept all these things secret and I maintained a you know, com calm composure on the outside. Now the eating disorder reared its ugly head at the age of 14. It was the transition between grade school to high school. I'm half Chinese, and for the first 13 years of my life, I like to say that I identify with being Asian because I went to a school that was 95% Asian and an orchestra as well. Um, and so, you know, we were very sheltered. The focus was on academic achievement, musical excellence. And for the most part, you know, we didn't care about social, social pressures. We wore uniforms, we were sheltered. But when I went to high school, it was the stuff I had seen in television. All of a sudden, I was transported into an episode of 90210 or Gossip Girl. I don't know if you watched that. Uh, people were wearing makeup, fancy clothes, driving cars, dating. I just needed to fit in. I was 14 and I was like, I need to fit in. So that first year, I ditched all my best friends from grade school and I started hanging out with a group of popular girls. And I started to wear makeup, I started dating, and I tried everything to do to fit in. But my parents weren't happy with this, and so they tried to stop it. And this is when I started to lead a double life. I started to be sneaky, full of lies and deceit. When my mom, she would like take away my makeup, and I would go to school, put it on in the bathroom, and then before I got home, I would wash it off. When they wouldn't let me buy the clothes I wanted, I started to steal. I was even caught a few times. And when they let, didn't let me go out, I would find ways to sneak out. So I was living a double life, and it was stressful. It was so stressful. So I took all of that pressure and I relieved it in the form of an eating disorder. So I would eat my meals and then I would go to the bathroom and throw up. And I thought I was being sneaky about this, but a few friends and my mom found out and I was sent to um, a therapist and um, a clinic. And so they monitored me. They monitored me and there's so much surveillance around me and all of a sudden, my eating disorder realized, oh shoot, I'm dying. My eating disorder got scared and it turned me into a monster, into a demon. I started yelling and throwing tantrums and screaming and breaking things. And the police were called to my house about a dozen times during this period of my life. Um, and I became a demon because I wanted to push everybody who loved me away. I wanted to isolate myself so I could be alone with the eating disorder. And so that's what I did. And soon the bulimia transformed into anorexia, and my life became a series of uh, calculations. I have Excel spreadsheets and journals of calories ingested, calories burned. It, it, I counted gum, I counted Diet Coke, two calories, one calorie, everything, obsessively. I would always be pacing around. I would always be pacing because I couldn't let myself stand still or sit because that meant I wasn't burning calories. When I was cold and I was shivering, I would let myself shiver, shiver in bed because that burned calories. And I remember in 2006, I had the honor of going to China with my orchestra, my youth orchestra. And we were treated to the best feasts in all of China by dignitaries. We went to the best Peking duck house. I didn't eat a thing. I had one box of Kashi Go Lean Puff cereal that I allowed myself to eat for the entire two weeks. And by the, by the time I came back to school junior year, I was a walking skeleton and people were scared. Now, I didn't finish junior year. I got my GED through homeschooling because I was in and out of hospitals and treatment centers. And uh, I went to college to UC Davis, had to leave after two weeks because I was binging in the dining halls. Um, and I, you know, I just kept, I just kept doing this. And then so the anorexia eventually became uh, binging and purging because your body can only handle so much starvations before it screams for food. And so I became a serious binge eater and purger. So for example, I would get to a buffet at 11 and leave at three. And during those four hours, I planned this very carefully. I would go back and forth from the buffet bar to the point my, where my rib cage hurt and I couldn't breathe. 
because I ate so much food. And then I would go to the bathroom and throw up until I could taste the acid in my esophagus, burning my mouth and teeth. And at this point in my life, I just wanted to stop. I was sick of this. What happened to me? What happened to this girl? You know, what happened? And I always wanted to get better. And I remember lying on these bathroom floors, just thinking, okay, this is it. I'm going to get better. This is the rock bottom. I'm done with this. But I couldn't get better for two reasons. The first one is that people don't realize this, is that an eating disorder is an addiction like any other addiction. When you binge and purge, or when you don't eat, your serotonin rises. And then it plummets. And the only way for it to rise again is if you start binging and purging again. So a lot of people think, oh, it's about you know, being skinny and all that. But it's not. It's an addiction. I go to AA meetings now because it's an addiction. And second of all, I'm sure everyone, well, not everyone knows, but it's, it's, it's pretty common knowledge to know that you can't recover alone from an addiction. And I tried doing that. I had an image of a recovered Gabby in the future, happy, bright, smiling, maybe with like some family, some kids, and no eating disorder. But I didn't let anybody come in between that. It was just this and that. That was it. And that was a big problem, because you can't do it alone. And then, only then, is when I started to play violin in the streets of Palo Alto. It wasn't some romantic bohemian notion that many people think that, oh, I'm going to stand here and play, and, and then I'll launch a successful music career, and you become a darling of Silicon Valley. No, no, it wasn't that. I was sick. I put out my box because I didn't know what to do. I just quit my job in sales. I was living at home. I was 21. I was, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I was, it, it was just nonsense. And so I put out my box one day, and I started to play, and then, I guess, like many entrepreneurs, this accident became my career. Um, and so I started to do things like analyze market trends. Um, I would stand in front of the places where there would be a lot of traffic. For example, when the iPhones came out, I always knew stand in front of that Apple store because there's going to be a long line of people shaking, where's my iPhone? Um, and they, they would always give me money. I'd play some calming music, and then they'd get their iPhone. They'd be like, yay, and then give me more money. And I was, so one, one New Year's Eve, I actually made about 500 bucks in an hour, and I would go places and pay for things and like dollar bills and pennies and quarters and be like, what's going on? Why do you have these ones? What's, hmm? um, I always had that conversation. It was kind of funny. Um, and yeah, so this became my career. So I started to play along to hip hop music, like Royals and other, anything, really anything. I can improvise. I listen to something and I can just play it like that. So people would give me requests. And I became a violinist, the violinist of Silicon Valley. I was hired for events. But what really changed is that I started talking about my story to this new group of friends. I started to tell people. Now take in mind, I was surrounded by these CEOs and these like tycoons of Silicon Valley. And I was like, wow, these people must have it put together. So I started to tell them my story, and what I realized was this. When I told my story and I was vulnerable with them, they were vulnerable with me, and I came to this realization that everybody is messed up. That's right. We all have problems, okay? We all have problems. We just don't talk about them. And that's why, you know, we go to our therapist's office and then, you know, psychiatrists, they give us medications and then, you know, we try, we try to like hide it and everyone hides it. Everyone hides it. But I didn't and I don't. And um, so I guess that's how I'm becoming a remarkable disruptor today. I'm disrupting the social stigma that you don't talk about your problems. That's what I'm disrupting. So I know it might be hard for any of you out there to go ahead and talk about this story. I know it might be really hard. In fact, if you told me five years ago to, to go talk about my story, I'd be like, hell no, I'm not doing that. You know, it's not, not, not happening. But what I would have been really happy to do is if I could have you know, showed, showed my mom a video of a girl talking about a problem she had, maybe that would have started a dialogue. You know, just opening that one inch, maybe that would have started a dialogue and I could relieve some pressure. Because the one point that I have today is that when you hide it, your demon gets more power, and when you tell it, the demon's power is gone. And that was the one thing that changed. Now, last but not least, I'm going to play Amazing Grace, which I played on the street many times, made me a lot of money. Um, but today I'm going to play it because the lyrics are actually true. I once was lost, and now I'm found. So, one moment before you clap.
Thank you.